Um, I want to get out of the way real quick that I, I have no tech fetish and I don't have any tech pathology. You know, this is a cartoon where this guy is saying, you kids and your cloud computing, and he says, Dan, you're just a few years older than me. So I, I don't think it's going to save the world and I don't think it's that damaging either. There's also a concept that tech is ruining us and, and I actually don't think that's happening either. Uh, newspapers didn't ruin us. And as of 1815, we can see that they were worried that students would become too dependent on paper and they wouldn't know how to write on slate. Um, so you can worry all day long that gadgets are going to make us less human and I'm here to tell you that nothing's really done that. So I've got a quick little 60-second um, video that I had created that kind of points out my point of view. Now, just before you see it, it's, it's just a caricature of me. It's not actually like how I think, but it's a fun kind of over-the-top video. So if we can run the sound on that, that'd be great. And it didn't run, so no video. Okay. Nobody's more used to tech problems than me. So, uh, <laughs> that's all right, you don't need to do it. There's an abundant amount of information that we're losing moment to moment. How can we harvest this information to create a reality in a system? The information of you is the future. People will create an assisted reality, created on demand as you need it. There are no such thing as thought leaders. Serotonin is a thought leader. I'm aware. Can you imagine if you had the opportunity to build a commercial for yourself? You'd make it a little over the top. Um, <laughs> So, so what happened last year, uh, I was, two years ago, I was at a conference and a reporter saw me and he saw my computer and he said, what is all the information on your screen? I said, well, it's my life. He said, what do you mean it's your life? I said, everything I touch that's connected to anything electronic, I see if there's a way to get information out of it and I take that information and pipe it into a system. He says, explain this to me. And this is where the story starts. So basically in 2008, I was kind of struggling with my career. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I thought, oh gosh, well, what jobs will probably be around in 10 years? Because I was like, I need to be employable in 2020. And I figured, well, personal information is probably going to be really important because so much information is online right now. But the question I had for myself was how personal was that information needed to be? And what I came up with was this concept that it had to be the information about you, the information that you create when you're just going about your everyday life. This information... Uh, started presenting itself to me in very interesting ways. The first way was when I saw my physician and I said to my doctor, can you tell me three years ago, I remember I had this exact same symptom and my doctor took like an hour to try to find the spot where I was in three years ago. So about six months later, I requested all my medical records, had them scanned and then paid someone to transcribe them all so I could find my own information. The second problem I ran into when I was researching how to get my personal information is if you look at all of the information you create, and all the applications you use and all the devices you could wear, it's mind-blowing how much information is out there that you can't see. And the fact that it's on all these different systems makes you feel broken and it makes you feel helpless. Just because you're wearing something that makes you healthier, you shouldn't have to log into eight different devices to get information from it. And then finally, the, the third problem was, uh, and I think it's, it's perfectly said if you've ever played Nintendo, at the end of Nintendo, when you pull the game out from the 80s, it says, everything not saved will be lost. And that's true of the information in our lives. If we don't save it, we lose it. And finally, the fourth problem I found when I started this journey was we're living in kind of a data elysium. There are the haves and have-nots, the people who can afford to get the data out of the systems they're using and those people who can't. And I believe that if we don't fundamentally start the conversation on who owns our data and where is it and how can we at least get access to it, we're going to really be at a, at a, at a dead end. Um, there's this concept in uh, social media called Zuckerberg's Law, and Zuckerberg's Law basically says that every year we share twice as much information as we did the year before. So in this case, you've got LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, 23andMe uh, over here, which is a DNA system, and then Fitbit. 
And what I'm finding is a lot of people who meet me at conferences and in the real world, they'll want to be my 23andMe friend, but they don't really care about knowing what I do for a living or what I share online or who I'm friends with. So we have this, int this data intimacy problem where people don't have this normal progression of getting to know someone. They just want to know how much heart disease you have, not if you have a cat. And I think that's, that's systemic of the type of change in his, uh, human behavior, especially when it comes to how we think about our lives that we're seeing. For me, I have lots of devices. I really divide them up into two categories, the Internet of Things, the devices around my home that measure and collect information, and then the devices that I wear. Uh, so on here, you'll see a lot of devices that are in my home or in my vehicle, on my pet, things that I wear, um, things that are uh, on me at all times, things that I've done inside my body. Uh, and how I break them up is I break them into two categories. Things in white are things that share information or display it back to me. And things in black are, inf are things that are collecting information from me. So today I have a heart rate sensor on that's monitoring this session. I'm wearing a Lumo back, which is telling me am I standing up straight. If I kind of bend over, it's going to vibrate, kind of like mom as a service. And it's going to say stand up straight. Uh, I have on my arm a motion and a galvanic skin response system called a body media. Um, and you'll. I just keep them in black and white to kind of explain to people the difference. But on here you'll notice almost everything's in white. But what I found as soon as I started collecting this information five years ago was I was seeing patterns where you could overlay information on top of each other. Uh, this was a picture that I took while I was walking down the street and it, and it offered me the ability to tie into it what song I was listening to and the information about the weather outside. So that one picture allowed me to see a lot more than just what I was looking at. But I noticed as I took that same journey that day that there was more and more information being collected about me. But what could I do with that information? So in this case, I looked at what it was like to actually go out and buy lunch. And what I found was the paying for lunch, going to get lunch, the activity to actually get there, because in this case I ran to lunch, uh, all kind of led to this one lunch data picture that was imperceptible without a view of it. It just looked like going to lunch, but to me, there were all these different data segmentations. So what I did was I created this low friction data scale. So basically, it's really hard to, to write your whole life on a cave wall. Um, it's, it's, much, it's really hard to get an old person in a village to remember everything that's happened. But as you've noticed, it's gotten easier to remember everything. So where does that really lead us? So what I did was I tied my life into really 10 areas. Uh, anything to do with health, entertainment, environment, social media, and knowledge work, which is basically anything I get paid for. Um, travel, opinion, content creation, money, or spirituality. And then I took every single thing I could inside those systems and then broke them into data elements. So think about the periodic table, but the periodic table of your life. I then took that and said, what would it look like if I moved every single data element into a Google Calendar? So my calendar is uh, anywhere between three and 700 systems at any given moment that can collect everything that's going on about my life, including what I'm saying, how loud I'm talking right now, what I'm seeing. Uh, the information becomes quite profound. What's great about the visualization is it allows me to make correlation and see patterns within my life I didn't know existed before. So instead of having the internet, I have the internet. I can search my life at any point, find out where I was, who I was with. I can use it to da data modeling and predictions. I use an open um, uh, engine through Stanford University to do deep learning on text dumps. I have approximately five terabytes of text data on my life right now from the last five years that I can look at. I then took that uh, information and I mapped it to Maslow's hierarchy of needs so that I could kind of figure out like where my life was going well and where it wasn't going well to see if there were certain things I could start to fine tune in my life. Uh, and then I, I collect all this information also in, uh, in Evernote and Google Docs. I also push it into spreadsheets so I can run reports on it. Um, but the most interesting thing I found was it's also tying in and turning out to be a true identity service. Right now we have to use passwords and we have to use um, uh, you know, bio-authentication, but ultimately your behavior is the, the real identifier in who you are. Just ask a police officer or somebody who's ever done any type of investigation. It's the activity. So what I found was all of my biological systems tied into all of the business services I use to have to create you know, a living, tied into all the lifestyle services I use, the movies that go to entertainment, to all the people I interact with, to all of the stuff, kind of create this super digital identity that we're starting to evolve into. Um, what I did was I actually then took it out and moved all the services from this slide into this slide so you could kind of get an idea of who I am from that world. Uh, Dmitry Ishkov from Russia, who's an oligarch there who wants to you know, create an avatar 
I was speaking with him last summer, and he said, I want to send a human into cyberspace. And I said, let me be your monkey. And he was like, oh, that's kind of creepy, but I get what you're saying. I could see how we could take all of your information and move it into cyberspace very quickly. Uh, I didn't stop there. I've had my genome sequenced. I've also had my biome uh, 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 looked at by a company called Ubiome, so I could start to understand more about the internal workings of my health. There's a company I'm working with called Exogen that does uh, weekly readings on my blood to see DNA breakage so I can change behavior to say, did taking a vitamin actually make a difference? Um, and then there's really interesting data patterns. So in this case, the actual air quality in my house is directly tied to my ability to drive safely. So this is a sensor in my car, a sensor in my house, and then an air quality or CO2 measurements to see when and how I'm actually behaving. Uh, so there's, there's data linkages between all these things, and the wearable devices and the, and the devices in our house really allow us to expose this information. Uh, I've lost 100 pounds. Uh, I'd like to say that I did a lot of hard work. I did, but in the beginning, I used the information just to understand I need to sleep earlier. I need to avoid this person, and I need to, take the, I need to be nicer to the dog. There were very simple things in my life that were affecting what I ate and what I didn't eat and how I moved and how I didn't move. And I think so often we're told, just move more and eat better. And that's not possible if you're surrounded by really bad information coming from really crazy people. I also found that all these systems actually start to react to each other. So in this case, this is just one me creating information in a system, but this is other systems reacting to that information. So much to my astonishment, I found that many of the systems I was using actually had relationships with each other on the other side. So just because they look disparate doesn't mean they're not, but it's up to us to really get this information out. Ultimately, I found that I have a relationship with all of the things in my life that are censored up now, and I have a lot of things in my life that are censored up. So basically, my concept is called the internet. Let's take this information and make it exposable to us. We're at a conference where we have a lot of people talking pr very provocatively about the future of wearable technology, but they're not talking about the future of the information of wearable technology. What is it, what good is it to us? Well, right now it's good to the people making it because they can exploit it and use it for their own financial gain. But we are the people who have to use this information. It's not like our economies globally are getting any better. So it's time to talk about, wait a minute, that's my information, I want a copy of it. And, and learning how to use that information really is the skill set of the next century. I won't go into all the crazy stuff that you've already heard from all the other speakers about how cool wearable technology is and the stats and stuff. But I think it's important to say wearable tech has been around for a long time. There are groups of people like diabetics who have not been as fortunate as runners. They've been stuck with some of the, some of the most legacy, unupdatable technology in the world. Ask any diabetic how difficult it is to get their information out. So there is really uh, some disparity in this. There are also pioneers. Stephen Mann in 1995 uh, had a website where he streamed everything he saw. So this is not new. This is 1995. This stuff has been around. What hasn't been around is our awareness to appreciate the information or the ability to buy it at a consumer level. Uh, I went to Disneyland growing up. I'm 45 years old. Today, if you go to Disney World, your kids actually get bands with their names on them to track everything they're doing. So this is, if Disney thinks it's safe, it's safe. My question would be, what are you doing with the information Disney? Um, there's lots of different types. I've, you know, I'm going to run out of time, so I won't go into all the different types of wearables I think are important and why I think they're important. Uh, kind of the next step, a chapter would be imperceptible electronics, uh, the history of, of wearables. A lot of people, when they meet me and they read about me in the news, they think I'm going to look like this, but I don't look like this. Uh, I, I don't want anything on me if I don't want to, if I, can't, if I had a choice, but right now we're kind of stuck with where we are. A reporter earlier asked me, you know, like, you, you know, you have a lot of stuff on, isn't that bothersome? I'm like, yeah, but my first computer I couldn't pick up either, right? So, you know, I'm patient, right? Can we be a little patient, right? There's, let's stop fetishizing and pathologizing this behavior. Um, it, one of the biggest things that people talk about when they see a lot of wearable technology is this idea of surveillance or privacy. Um, this is a police, police officer in my town. He's wearing a camera filming me while I'm filming him. These are drones in the skies. We're in England. There are cameras everywhere. But this is me wearing my narrative camera, having dinner with my partner, and, and this is a capture wristband, which is recording everything that happens around you in real time. There is no difference. One is I'm in control, one is someone else is. And we need to just be aware and be sensitive to when we're talking to each other and explaining these technologies, it doesn't have to be scary and intrusive. It doesn't have to look like this world. It can look like having dinner and listening to your kids. <clears throat> this is something called open informant. This was developed during a hackathon. You can uh, actually get the SDK off of GitHub. 
but it's a little ink, ink badge that shows you everything that's being collected on you at that moment. So if you ever want to know what's going on in your life, you're just dripping with information, right? But you probably have no idea what it is. So you can lo look up Open Informant and, uh, and get the code and kind of create one of these yourself. Uh, I am only four minutes out of time, but basically, like I said earlier, everything for me falls into a couple of different categories. There's the collect, a uh, collection of information, which goes right now into health, identity, personal, and corporate information. There's the projection of information, which is haptic feedback, uh, visual sensors, location-based context, um, uh, haptic comm and visual. And then there's the reflect, which is showing you information, showing you context, and showing you reality. To me, the context part of this is really interesting. And there's a lot of different types of context that I've explored through my wearable technology that I can't demo today because I don't have a lot of time. But I wanted to give you three that I thought were the most cutting edge. So biological context, like I said, I think this company Lumobax is doing something neat by giving you low friction feedback on how you're sitting. Uh, beyond that, neurological context. So this is a company called Melon that actually, it's a headband you wear that actually shows you where you're paying attention. I think that's really important when you think about schools. Bill and Melinda Gates did something like this two years ago with wristbands. Uh, and then there's genetic context, this company called Minome, which basically will f sequence your GN DNA for you, but then show you only targeted results on things you're probably susceptible to. So if you're going to lose your hair, articles or advertisements are for PISA. Uh, but this is a day in the life of context. So this isn't a system telling me to leave home now. This is when I got to the airport, a, a system that popped up my boarding pass. When I went to the wrong gate, an eye beacon told me I was at the wrong gate. When I got to where I was going, I got a heads up display that said my luggage was at this carousel. And when I walked outside, it offered me a car. So information contextually in the day of wearables makes a lot of sense. But we're not taking time to talk about information on wearables. We're talking about how cool they are. Well, let's get over that. Um, ultimately, there are two types of reality we're dealing with here. There's me in Orlando trying to figure out where my gate is or what Google Glass showed me, a translating a sign. Or what I love now is Google allows me to do context location. So when I'm at the mall at Christmas, I actually, my glass actually tells me to shop less. Or if I've spent too much, I get a push message because I use a service that keeps track of my bank account that says stop spending money now. Um, and then there's this idea, that's augmented reality. And then there's this idea of diminished reality. So basically, some work that Stephen Mann did early on where you actually wearable technology changes signs to give you reminders and pop-ups and information. All of this turns into uh, the Internet of Things plus the quantified self, or what I call existence as a platform. So you just live your life without wearable technology or very, very imperceptible wearable technology, and the world around you changes. It starts with a symbiosis of technology and humanity, which I talked about in 2010. In 2010, it, 11, it pulls in reputation. Then we create this kind of new world where you've got all the information you've collected in the knowledge locker forced back to you. And it becomes a platform. So if, if, the, water, if the plants aren't watered and you're thinking about your mom, do something else. Uh, ultimately, life should be assisted in real time around you. But more importantly, like me, you could use this data to precondition your existence. So if I knew I have a speech today, I knew what time to go to bed last night, I knew what to eat, I knew what temperature the room needed to be, I knew how fast I needed to walk today. So preconditioning your environment so that it's almost like a social GPS for your life. That's it. I ran out of time. I only have one minute. I'll be available afterwards for questions. Thank you so much for coming.